Welcome back to another video. This topic is one of my favorites in the Elvis world, and I'm excited to share with you the story of Gary Pepper. Let's get started. Sterling Gary Pepper was not only a huge Elvis fan, but a trusted friend of his as well. Gary, as he was known, was born in 1931 with cerebral palsy. So cerebralpalsy.org describes it like this. It affects the body movement, muscle control, muscle coordination, muscle tone, reflex, posture, and balance. It can also impact fine motor skills and oral motor functioning. Let me be clear, Gary's physical body had challenges, but not his mind. Though he was confined to a wheelchair in the early days, he supported himself with a clipping business. So every day he would comb the newspaper looking for interesting articles about people, cut them out, mail it to them, and then explain his situation, asking for a small donation in return. He also reached out to celebrities, asking for their autograph in return. People like Clark Gable, even Marilyn Monroe sent him back an autograph picture. This is actually how he ended up in Elvis's world when Gary began clipping articles about a new singer from his hometown. When he read that Gladys kept a scrapbook of her son's achievements, Gary contacted her and gave her his clippings, and they became friends. Soon, Elvis struck up a friendship with his mom's new friend as well. Remember that Gary's muscles were affected by his condition, and since the tongue is made up entirely of muscles, his speech was difficult to understand. I learned that his words came out sounding like quick grunts with just the first part of the word sounded out. His mother could understand him, of course, but so could his friend Elvis. Elvis would concentrate and take the time to understand what he was saying. When Elvis was stationed in the army, his cousin Bobby Smith, Billy Smith's older brother, created the Elvis Tankers Fan Club, which was named after Elvis's battalion. Soon after, Bobby passed the torch to Gary, who relished and thrived in his new role as fan club president. He sent out newsletters to fans all over the world, everywhere, or as Gary called it, Elvisware, updating fans on projects Elvis was working on, information about his family, and answering fan questions. Gary would dictate and his mother would type. He actually became incredibly popular with fans and almost like a celebrity himself. These newsletters were a wealth of information and I can't imagine how exciting these updates were to fans just like us. Here's an example of what the newsletter would look like arriving to your house. Gary created these newsletters until 1963 due to the rising cost of postage and health issues. Gary was there at the Memphis Bunton train station in March 1960 when Elvis returned home from the army at 7.45 a.m. It was freezing and windy, but Gary was prepared with a huge welcome home sign. In this picture, he's apologizing to Elvis for the size of the crowd not being bigger, reminding him it was a school day. Gary described this as the biggest thrill of his life. The station was demolished just a few years later. In the early days, Elvis enjoyed renting out Rainbow Roller Dome for him and his friends. Years later, Gary described, Elvis gave me a real treat. He pushed me around the rink several times in my wheelchair. I didn't know that old wheelchair could travel that fast. Now, let's hear from Elvis himself. So later that October, he was in Hollywood filming Flaming Star when he got a visit from Gary during an interview. Elvis told the reporter, We've been knowing each other since I first started out. He's one of my good friends. When I'm back in Memphis, Gary is with me almost every night. We go out and see the town and have a big old time. He was one of the first ones to greet me at the train station when I got back from the army. I go over and pick him up in my car and he goes everywhere with me. To that, Gary commented, it gets kind of dull back home when Elvis is gone. On calling Memphis home, Elvis said, I'm always glad to get back to that part of the country. The people are the greatest. Take Gary, for example. They just don't come any nicer than him. In March 1961, Elvis performed a benefit concert in Hawaii that raised $65,000 for what we now know as the USS Arizona Memorial in Pearl Harbor. Elvis, not known for much letter writing, wrote Gary this letter updating him on the show, the movie he's about to start, as well as his love for Hawaii and Memphis. Gary would actually put flowers on Gladys' grave at Christmas and on the anniversary of her passing. When Elvis and Anita Wood broke up, she kept a ring he had given her before he went into the army that was set with several diamonds. Elvis had worn it on his pinky, but Anita wore it on a necklace. When Anita gave it to Gary, he also wore it on his pinky. Here he is pictured wearing the ring at Anita Wood's wedding to football player Johnny Brewer in 1964. 
Gary's old house at 793 Eva Street has been demolished and is now part of a Walgreens parking lot, but let's take a look at the neighborhood. In Jerry Schilling's book, Me and a Guy Named Elvis, Jerry recalls when he and Elvis went to Gary's house to deliver a much needed wheelchair. After knocking and getting no response, Elvis just walked right in. The two found Gary crawling on the floor, powerless to get upright, and his mother in an unresponsive trance-like state. Both hadn't eaten in several days. This scene was traumatic for Jerry, but he said Elvis jumped right in to help. In 1966, Gary gathered support from fans all around the world and made the case to the city commission to have the Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis renamed the Elvis Presley Coliseum. Two fans from overseas who were visiting Memphis and friends with Gary spoke before the commission on his behalf. And initially, Mayor Bill Ingram, who Elvis named a horse after, Mayor Ingram, agreed and sent this official proclamation to Gary. However, days later, the plans were canceled after the change sparked controversy with city and county commissioners, and I'm sure Gary was crestfallen. But when Elvis learned of these plans, he didn't like it. He would have accepted the honor if it happened organically, but he just didn't feel it was necessary to beg for the opportunity. Graceland.com claims Gary had a hand in or inspired the renaming of Highway 51 South to Elvis Presley Boulevard in 1971. Elvis and Priscilla held a second wedding reception at Graceland on May 29, 1967 for close family and friends that weren't able to attend their Vegas wedding. Who was there but Gary Pepper to celebrate with the couple? Then the following February, when Lisa Marie was just 10 days old, Gary was invited to Graceland to meet the new baby where his mom took these pictures. Elvis liked to shower Gary with thoughtful gifts. For Christmas that year, he bought him a brand new Chevy Impala convertible for him and his parents, complete with power windows so Gary could use them. Over the years, he received numerous gifts any Elvis fan would love, but a TV with remote control to make it easier for him to use was probably extra special. In the late 60s, Gary was even corresponding with Elvis's estranged grandfather, Jesse Presley, giving him updates and pictures of Elvis's activities. Gary attended the banquet for the JC's 10 Outstanding Young Men in January 1971 at the Holiday Inn Rivermont in Memphis. Elvis inscribed the program to Gary and Carl Nichols, who was his caretaker at the time. Elvis hired Gary's father, Sterling, to work security at Graceland, where he alternated shifts with Harold Lloyd and Vester Presley, with Mr. Pepper taking the graveyard shift. Unfortunately, that is where he died on July 23rd, 1970. He was working in the guard shack when he died suddenly of a heart attack. According to Follow Me to Tennessee by Andrew Hearn, Sterling Pepper Sr. would always read the newspaper at the start of his shift, and the time of death was determined by the page number he was on. Sterling Sr.'s death was a breaking point for the Pepper family. Gary's mother, Nell, had a complete mental breakdown and became massively depressed, unable to care for her son, let alone herself. Her condition became so deteriorated that soon the two were living in squalid conditions. Elvis had his dad's friend Carl Nichols look after them by hiring nurses, but Gary and his mom were such a challenge that no one ever lasted. So Elvis tasked Carl with finding a permanent caregiver for Gary and Nell. Around 1974, nurse and massive Elvis fan Nancy Pease was quickly hired to take care of them. By 1976, Nancy, her mother Helen, and her kid brother Dennis were all living in Gary's two-bedroom house on Eva Street. They pooled their money together with Gary being on Elvis's payroll and Nell and Nancy's mother receiving social security. Nancy did not receive a salary. Elvis paid him $135 weekly for his role as fan club coordinator and foreign correspondent, which would equal about $2,500 a month today. Then Nancy and her mom purchased a four bedroom house directly next door to Vernon for all of them to have more space and to be closer to Graceland. It's often said that Elvis bought this house for Gary, which sounds exactly like something he would do, but that's not the case. I visited this house earlier this year. Let's check it out.
In a mid-70s Christmas card from Priscilla to Gary and his mother, she writes, Sorry I missed you while I was in Memphis. Hopefully next time Lisa and I can visit with you. I hope you are both doing well. I think of you often. Gary even got a shout out from the stage at Elvis's last Memphis concert on July 5th, 1976. In the late 70s, Gary was writing for the Graceland Fan Club's newsletter with a chapter called Memories. Gary had dreams of helping people just like him. This 1976 article details his wish to establish a cerebral palsy rehabilitation center in Memphis. He connected with the Scott, Mississippi, New Madrid annual walkathon in Missouri, two hours from Memphis, to participate and spread awareness for his cause. He titled it the Gary Pepper Cerebral Palsy Fund in honor of Elvis Presley. 200 supporters turned up in the cold for the five mile hike. The event ended up raising over $8,000, exceeding expectations. The rehab center in Memphis never came to fruition, but some of that money went to the United Cerebral Palsy Fund in that area. I can't tell you the last time Gary and Elvis saw each other. However, his tax returns for 1977 show his new title of promotion coordinator. Gary even got a key to the city in December 1977. In the late 70s, Gary underwent a new experimental surgery for his spasms. Nancy encouraged him to do this, believing it would improve his day-to-day -day life. Gary reluctantly went through with it, but this caused a rift in their relationship. Gary didn't or couldn't express why he didn't want to change. To speak more on this topic is Nancy herself, who kindly did an interview with me, where she goes into details about this surgery. That will be in an upcoming video. In late October 1977, Gary received his pink slip from Graceland, with Vernon's attorney calling him an unnecessary employee. By April 1978, they all moved out of the home on Dolan Drive and moved to Iowa with Nancy and her family. Here are the two pictured on Gary's red motorized cart. In this 1978 article from Nancy's hometown of Cedar Rapids, Gary and Nancy described how they met and their Elvis connection and how they were struggling financially with their clipping business. So what happened to Gary Pepper? This story differs depending on who tells it, so I'll tell you both sides since I spoke to both parties. After Elvis died, Memphis was a sad place for her and Nancy wanted to move on, return to Iowa and go back to school. Gary wanted to stay in Memphis, but that just wasn't possible. Gary and his mom were unhappy in Iowa and decided to move to Southern California with family. Nancy says she placed Gary in a nursing home, which she referred to as a holding area, until Gary's family could come move him to California. Gary's relatives dispute this and say he was dumped in an insane asylum with his mother in a nursing home separately, which they say is worse because only his mother could understand him. They claim that next, Gary placed a frantic phone call to his grandmother for help. Now, before you judge anyone's actions, I want you to hear from Nancy herself, and you will in an interview next week. Gary and Nell moved to Long Beach, California, where they spent the remaining years in their own home. Gary died of pneumonia on March 29, 1980, at 48 years old. Nell Pepper died two years later. In an article from 1993 about Gary's house for sale, the seller said Aunt Delta's dog Edmund would dig under the fence and appear in her yard. She even believed the house was haunted by a playful spirit. This story does not end there. Nearly 30 years after Gary's passing, he's back in the news. His Elvis collection, which was unlike any other collection, of course, was up for auction through a Chicago auction house. Over 200 real items given to him by Elvis himself over the span of 20 years, including clothing, concert scarves, autographs, Elvis's hair, Music from Elvis's own collection, original photographs, personal letters, a front row ticket to Elvis's August 27, 1977 show in Memphis, and dried roses from atop his casket. This massive collection had been in Nancy's sister's possession all these years. In 2009, her sister put it up for auction. As soon as Gary's relatives saw this advertised on the news, they were outraged. When Gary moved to California, he only took his most prized possessions. They were a gold bracelet inscribed from EP 122565, two gold rings, a Rolex oyster watch from Elvis, autographs, Sun Studio Records, a home video of Priscilla's baby shower, photographs of Elvis, Gary, and Nell, and a letter from Elvis sent from Germany. 
Gary's family had no knowledge of this collection, but believed it was rightfully theirs as Gary's relatives, especially since his cousin John was his legal guardian at the end of his life. The matter went to court multiple times. Meanwhile, the collection, which amassed $250,000, was held in escrow. Nancy claimed that Gary told her to keep it until he asked for it back. She said it was never gifted to her, but that Gary left it with her because she was a fan. His family, however, alleges that she stole it. I've spoken to both parties, Gary's cousin and his nurse, Nancy. Just keep in mind there are two sides to every story. When you read about the lawsuit, it appears it's a fight over money. Here's this massive collection that's obviously valuable, but what I learned surprised me. Nancy didn't keep it for herself. She stored it, and after Gary died, she gave it to her sister, who was a huge fan and treasured the items. Gary's family's position is that anything that was his belongs to them. But more than that, Gary needed physical care, and that was expensive. Gary's cousin made the point to me that his collection could have been sent over back then, and they could sell it and pay for private nurses. Of course, that's easy to say, but Gary was an Elvis fan through and through. That was his whole identity. Maybe knowing his family back in California weren't fans, it makes sense that he would want the collection to be appreciated. I've actually seen a few items from the Gary Pepper collection, not knowing it at the time, but they are definitely appreciated today. Finally, in 2015, the case was settled in favor of Nancy and her sister. The jury was shown pictures of Gary and Nancy together, as well as letters he had written her as evidence of their close relationship. A letter from Gary to Nancy was presented to the court. It read, Dearest Nancy, thanks so much for what you have done for me and my dear mom this past year. I won't be able to repay you in a million years. Please know I appreciate it. May God always keep you forever. I will always love you. The judge said, quote, given this evidence, a reasonable jury could find that Gary wanted the collection to be owned and maintained by a friend who shared his love of Elvis, who had taken care of him and his mother for years, who recognized the significance of the collection, and that Gary never told his relatives about it since they weren't fans. I found an article about Gary from 1952 titled Success Stories. He's 19 years old, being interviewed about his clipping business an outlook on life despite his challenges. The author clearly admires his entrepreneurial spirit and positive perspective. Gary says, my desire to help others has kept me from despondency over my misfortune. I hope Gary felt like a success story. At the height of the Tankers fan club, he was connecting 5,000 fans worldwide with Elvis and simultaneously recording history as it was happening for us to enjoy all these years later. Gary is buried with his parents in Mount Moriah, Tennessee, about an hour outside Memphis, where a lot of fellow peppers are buried. No matter who receives money for the sale of these items, the collection is a testament to a friendship that spanned over 20 years. It shows Gary's devotion, as well as Elvis's kindness to his number one fan turned friend. And that is it. To get a closer look at the pictures I used in this video, follow me on Facebook or Instagram. The links are in the description box below. I'll be sharing them on there. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a big thumbs up and share it wherever there are Elvis fans. As always, thank you so much for watching and please subscribe for more adventures.